Thank you, and good evening. My name is Chris Reagan, and the clock only begins once I press this button. <laughs> Energy transition uh, are words that we will hear a lot about, uh, I suspect, in the next four weeks and probably in the next 40 years. Um, and I think when talking about energy transition, we need to talk about what we are transitioning from and when, what we are transitioning to and why. So I'd like to talk about what an energy transition looks like and how we do it. And let me begin, I'm gonna give you seven slides and eight words, and you'll know in about six minutes why I couldn't bring it down to seven words. So let's start with something that doesn't get talked about very much and doesn't get talked about very much, especially at this end of the country. And this is the fabulousness of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels have built our society for 200 years or more. And there's a reason that fossil fuels have built our society. We are energy intensive, we love energy. Our prosperity has been built on the use of energy and almost nothing can compete with um, the power of fossil fuels. Millions of years of the Earth's heat, of the sun's heat, and the weight of the Earth's crust compressed in, in, in uh, biological materials to compress energy into a super dense form that is low price, it is transportable, it is convenient. It is really hard to compete with fossil fuels, and that is why we use so many of them. But there's a but, and the but is that as we have learned in the past 30 years or so, there is serious damage that comes from fossil fuels. And that damage is in the form of fossil fuels leaking out of pipelines into river systems. It's in the form, importantly, of greenhouse gas emissions that come from the combustion of fossil fuels. We need to pay attention to that damage. So how do we do it? Well, what we need to do is we need to decouple we need to decouple our economic prosperity from um, the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions that come from fossil fuels. And that is not so easy. What we want, I think, is a world where we still are prosperous, where we still have a good standard of living, where we have lots of food on our tables, where we can send our children to good schools, where we can go to good hospitals and go to nice national parks and all kinds of other things. But we want to do that in a world where our greenhouse gas emissions fall and fall and fall and eventually get to something way lower than they are now. So there are lots of choices. We want to transition to a world where we're doing a lot more of these things. Maybe it's hydropower. Maybe it's run of river hydropower. Maybe it's geothermal. Maybe it's biofuels. Maybe it's solar. Maybe it's things that we don't even know yet. We can't even imagine them yet because we haven't developed them yet. But that's the world that we need to move toward. But it's not so easy. If you are looking for a roadmap to the future, there isn't one. And the reason why there isn't an easy roadmap to the future is that we don't know what technologies will develop. We don't know whether run of river will become more economical and faster than geothermal, or both of those will be faster or slower than better battery storage power. We simply don't know. So, those people that are looking for a precise policy roadmap to the future will be disappointed, but you shouldn't be. This is the way technological change unfolds. So how do you make sense of a world in where there is this uncertainty, this confusion? I'm an economist, so my answer often is to start with this man. This is Adam Smith. He's a leading member of the Scottish Enlightenment. He's the founder of modern economics. And he was the first person to see order in what other people saw as chaos in a market system. He saw prices performing an organizing role in society. He knew that as prices went up, producers were led to produce more and consumers were led to economize. 
and he thought about how prices worked, how prices rose in some cases, how they fell. He was the first person back in 1776 when he wrote The Wealth of Nations to think about how markets and prices organized society. So as an economist, how do I think we should use that order? How do I think we should use that pricing? And the answer is in two words. It's carbon pricing. If we know what is bad, which is greenhouse gas emissions, and we don't quite know which technology is best, but we know that any technology that doesn't emit greenhouse gas emissions is a good thing. Well, we know what's bad, there's a lot of better choices, but we, we can't pick the winner in the marketplace. Carbon pricing is the tool for this job. Carbon pricing puts a price, call it a tax if you like, on greenhouse gas emissions. Off the tailpipe, out of the smokestack, out of the cement facility, out of a steel firm, out of an oil sands facility. Puts a price on those emissions and creates a powerful, powerful economic incentive to reduce, to reduce those emissions. And it does it in a way that is best for the economy. And this is why it's important to think about that decoupling. You want prosperity, but you want lower, way lower greenhouse gas emissions. That means you need to use a mechanism for reducing greenhouse gas emissions that is the lowest possible cost, the best for the economy. Ask any economist who tends to think about how markets work and how prices work, and they will tell you that the lowest cost way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is a carbon price. Put a carbon price in place, ramp it up, and watch those low carbon technologies be developed. They will be developed because now they will be more profitable ways to live life. And I'll end there. Thank you.